previously on You Can Beat Video Games. As the only survivor of a tragic maritime disaster, we washed up on the shore of Koholent Island, a mysterious place filled with mysterious inhabitants. We rescued a kidnapped chain chomp, traded items, and worked the local arcade to fund our expedition. Following the advice of a wise owl, we've been searching for the eight sirens' instruments. Only their magical song can wake the wind fish, freeing us from our imprisonment. But there are still four more instruments for us to find, more nightmarish bosses for us to battle, and many more secrets to uncover. So on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. And please join our Patreon for access to an exclusive Discord community and a chance to vote on future episodes. Let's get started. All right, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening Part 2. Before we jump back into our quest, let's take a look at a few secrets and Easter eggs. If you enter your name as Zelda, you'll be able to hear this special Salsa Dance remix of the original theme. This trick will work on almost every version of the game, although you'll have to spell it a bit differently in Japanese, but on some of the other versions, there are different songs hidden. In the original monochromatic French version of the game, try entering your name as Lolo to hear this secret song. So if you happen to have the French version of the game, you should certainly try this. In the French DX version of the game, you can still enter your name as Lolo, but the special song was replaced with the same one that you would hear for entering your name as Zelda. That's interesting, but in the original German version of the game, if you input your name as Moise, M-O-Y-S-E, you'll hear a special techno track that was slipped into the game by German translator Claude Moyes. Claude Moyes is a fairly famous translator in Germany and is notorious for putting his own personal spin on the translation. If you play the Japanese version of the game, you can input your name in as... Well, you can see it here on the screen. This will give you access to another secret piece of music and this one is a remixed version of Totaka's song. And if that sounds familiar to you, that's because sound programmer Kazumi Totaka likes to hide this piece in every project he works on. You may recognize it from Mario Paint. If you click on the O in Mario Paint, everything will explode, and you'll hear this. Yep, that's Totaka's song, all right. If you're not playing on the Japanese version of Link's Awakening, but you still want to hear Totaka's song, you can find it in Richard's Villa. You just need to wait around here for a few minutes, and eventually the music will fade out, and you'll hear this. So, if you'd like to hear Totaka's song, you can do it here in the North American version. You just need to wait around for a while in Richard's Villa. Something else that you can try whenever you have Bow Wow? Take him on a walk near Canalit Castle so he can meet Kiki the monkey. Kiki will try her hardest to fight the monster, but after taking several hits, she'll retreat and disappear from the screen. This may seem like a disaster, but you simply have to leave the screen and return to make her come back. Whenever you have Marin with you, try looking in a drawer and she'll passive-aggressively suggest that maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Also, if you try playing your ocarina in front of her, she'll tell you that you're not very good. Yeah, tell us what you really think, Marin. 
we know that Marin doesn't like it when you beat up on a chicken in this game, but if you harass a cuckoo for long enough in front of her, she'll eventually get strangely into it. Do it. Do it more. Um, chill out, Marin. Jeez. One last trick before we get back to our quest. You'll need to start up a new game for this one, and just make your way down to the beach and grab your sword. Then you want to return to the village. That's where we're going to do the trick. You need to go to Madame Meow Meow's doghouse, and we're going to try to clip into the edge of it. So go to the side and just try to clip into the right edge and push to the left. Once you're in here, you want to slash your sword and hold up into the left. Make sure you do that and you'll be able to get up into this part of the screen. Go up here. Then go left, walk directly up this path, and then if you enter this stairway, you'll suddenly be in the tail cave right next to where you get the feather. Now there's actually a lot that you can do in that glitched out area, including finishing the entire game, but this is one of the easier tricks you can do with it. Alright, let's get back to our main quest. After completing level 4 the Angler's Tunnel, we don't need a key or anything fancy to get into level 5, so if you just want to go directly to the Catfish's Maw, you can swim down there right now. However, getting the flippers opens up numerous new locations in the overworld, and if we head over to this small cave, you can dive down to find a piece of heart, which will give us enough to make another heart container. Nice! But that's not all we can find in this small area. If you head to the right, you'll see that it's a dead end, but if we swim back to the left and go past where the angler's tunnel was, you'll find another cave, this one with two fish carved into the walls outside of it. Inside, we're going to be able to learn a new song for our ocarina, and it's going to be the one that we use most frequently. Inside the cave, you'll meet Manbo, a talking, singing sunfish that predated the Big Mouth Billy Bass by a good five years. As long as you have an ocarina, he'll teach you his song, and if you play it in the overworld, it will take you to Manbo's Pond, a small place in the center of the overworld located right next to Crazy Tracy's store. It's useful to be able to warp anywhere in this game, but that's not all it does. If you play Manbo's Mambo in a dungeon, it will take you back to the entrance. So that's also pretty good. Just in case Lou Bega is still keeping track, Manbo's Mambo will be number two on your ocarina. If we head into this stairwell near the angler's tunnel, we'll be able to find a convenient way to get out of this small watery area. So just head over here, push the rock, jump over the pit, and head up the steps. If we head over to the right, we still need the hook shot to get across here, so we won't be going rafting on the river just yet. Instead, we're going to head over here to the left, and we'll see that there's a place that you can go into the water with your flippers, but we're not ready for that just yet. Instead, we're going to head up here to the warp hole, and that's going to take us back to the animal village. As we arrive in the animal village, we're suddenly haunted by a mysterious apparition. The ghost won't harm you and you won't be able to damage it with your weapons, but if we can help it along to the afterlife, we will be able to get some rewards. Before we do that though, let's stop into the goat's house and bring her the hibiscus flower that we found up on the mountain. The surly goat lady wouldn't even talk to us before, and now that we brought her flowers, she wants us to take a letter to her boyfriend? Link, bro. I don't think she's that into you. If you talk to her again after receiving the letter, she says that sometimes she can't help eating a delicious piece of paper. Well, I guess goats are gonna goat. Once you have the letter, make your way outside. We've been collecting the secret seashells for some time now, and we currently have 16 of them. We need 20 to get the level 2 sword, and now that we have the flippers, we should be able to find the remaining shells that we need. If you head down here, we'll meet a mermaid in the bay. She's looking for a missing necklace, 
although in the original Japanese version, she's looking for something else. We'll come back to that later. That large fish head is the next dungeon, the Catfish's Maw, but for now we're going to swim on by it and head over to the left where we can climb up out of the water. If we head down this way, we'll find a small island with a single bush on it. Whenever we cut that bush, we're going to find our 17th secret seashell. So we only need three more at this point, and there's another one very close to this location that we haven't picked up yet. You don't actually need the flippers to get this one. Just head over here to the right, cut this bush, and we found another secret seashell, bringing our total up to 18. Down here, clearly there's something hidden across the way. Let's use an arrow bomb to clear the bushes on the other side, and then we can easily jump across using our feather. You can use the boots and the feather to jump farther, but a diagonal jump from the top will get you across just fine. Down the stairs, we'll find a cave that you'll need to have the flippers to get through. So you'll need to be able to swim through the dark water here. Don't forget that you can dive to avoid the enemies, and then climb up the stairs on the other side. Over here, we're going to find another stairway, and inside is the second Mad Batter's Altar. So use some magic powder on the altar, and this time we want to get more arrows. We're going to be using a lot more arrows in the next few dungeons, so make sure to say no when he offers to give you more magic powder. We'll be able to increase our magic powder supply at the third and final Mad Batter's Altar, but we won't find it until much later in the game, so make sure that you pick arrows here. Once you've received your punishment for waking the Mad Batter, and you'll notice that we now have a full supply of 60 arrows, very nice, we can make our way out of here, and it's about time that we took care of our ghost friend. So we're going to go back down the stairs, and head back the way that we came. We're actually very close to the ghost's house, so we're going to visit that next. Chop the bushes and make your way to the left. We're going to walk right past the island where we found the secret seashell, and we'll need our Pegasus boots combined with the rock's feather to get across this three space gap. Once you're on the other side, the ghost will get very excited. Enter my house. I guess we're going in. The ghost floats around the room, quietly observing the dusty ruins of its former home, until it finally says, Nostalgia Unchanged. That line hit me pretty hard as I'm playing this game a good 30 years after it was first written. I totally get it, Ghosty. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Once you're outside, equip your ocarina and play Manbo's Mambo. The ghost's grave is actually located quite close to Manbo's pond, so this is a very fast way to get there. You may remember where the grave is. It's the one that we sprinkled some magic powder on back in part one, and it threatened to curse us. So head down past the buzz blob, and that's the grave we're looking for over there on the left, but we do need to take the long way around, and once we get this close, the ghost will thank us, and then tell us that there's something we can find in a jar back in the creepy house on Martha's Bay. Once the ghost fades away, our good friend the owl returns to remind us that the next dungeon is the catfish's maw in Martha's Bay, and it gives us a clue that we'll need to dive to find it. But don't leave the grave just yet. If you approach it, we'll be able to take a picture with the photographer. The photographer says that the ghost is happy now, but whenever he snaps the picture, it suggests that the spirit may still be here among us on this mortal plane of existence. So that's another photo for our album, and now that the ghost has been returned to its grave, we'll be able to find a secret seashell hidden in its house on Martha's Bay that just wasn't there before. We have 18 secret seashells now, so before we go back to the ghost's house, 
we're going to head to the area near where the key cavern was, and we'll be able to find the 19th secret seashell, and then we'll go back to the ghost's house to find number 20. So we're just going to follow the path along this way, and when you get here, you're going to head down and to the left. Using your flippers, jump into the water and swim across to the left here, and when you cut this bush, that's where we're going to find secret seashell number 19. Make sure to pick it up before it falls into the water, or you'll need to exit the screen and re-enter so that you can find it again. So we only need one more secret seashell now, and the ghost's house is not that far from here, so just follow the path along to the right, and instead of going up to the castle, we're going to head down at that juncture and continue to follow the path downwards. Head down along the right side of the rock maze, and as you follow the path, you'll be able to get into the water, and then we'll just swim over to the left and down, and that will take us back to this area that we were at just a few moments ago. From here, getting back to the ghost's house is easy. Just head down, and then follow the path to the left. You're going to need your Pegasus boots and Rock's feather to get across here, so do a little dash and then a big jump to get across. And on the other side, you will find the ghost's house. And inside, over here on the right, you'll need to use your power bracelet, and you'll be able to pick up these pots where you'll find that hidden secret seashell. If you had looked for this seashell before taking the ghost back to his grave, you would not find it. So that's it. That's the 20th secret seashell. All we need to do now is head back to Seashell Mansion to claim our prize. If you are short, there is another secret seashell located near the face shrine that you will be able to collect at this point in the game. I'll show you where that is a little bit later in the video, but if you need to head over there now, you can, and that will get you the last shell that you need. Assuming that you have the 20 secret seashells that you need, we're just going to head back out of the water up near the mermaid, work your way up past the rock maze, and then we're going to follow this path over to the right, and that's going to take you exactly where you need to go. Before we head into the mansion, something that you may want to try is using your magic powder on one of these trees. It'll give you a clue. Of course, the clue it gives you is to tap on dungeon walls with your sword so that you can hear that sound that indicates you need to blow them up with a bomb, something that we definitely knew already, but thanks anyway, tree. Inside, we'll finally get to watch the meter on the right fill to the top. A voice says, my job here is finished, but we never get a real explanation for why the spirits of the mansion needed the shells. In any case, in a flash of lightning, the sword appears. Take it into your hands and call out, I have the power, because the level two sword is awesome. Not only is this new sword more powerful, but if your health is completely filled, it can shoot beams, just as a good Zelda sword should. Once you've claimed this weapon, you won't be able to find any more secret seashells, although there are still a few more hidden in the game. I'll point out where those shells would be found if you didn't already have the sword. With this new level of power, we're ready for the next dungeon, so swim down to this screen. You'll see that the catfish's maw is surrounded by rocks, but if we dive down in the lower left corner, we'll find a hidden passage. Swim through and make your way to the surface to get to the dungeon's entrance. Just keep swimming. And here we go. Level 5, the Catfish's Maw. Once you get inside, head two screens to the left and you need to clear out all of the monsters in this room. There are four bats in here known as keys, and one iron mask that you need to hit from behind, like the dark nuts in previous games. One of the enemies dropped a guardian acorn, but we're still not picking those up, because even with our level 2 sword, we'd rather have a piece of power. In this room, you can pick up the compass and then head down the stairs, 
lower the lifts on the right side so that the ones on the left will be higher, and jump over to the ladder. The compass lets us know that there's a key in this room, and to get it we need to chop down these purple crystals and push the two purple blocks towards the middle. Once you've made a perfect square in the center of the room, a key will drop from the sky, and if we stop over in this room on the left, we'll notice a skull-shaped pattern in the tiles on the floor. We'll need to return there later after we face the Master Stolfos three more times. That's where we'll fight him the final time. But for now, we just need to get back to this room, clear out the two iron masks, and open the door on the right. Use the key that you just found to unlock the door at the top of this room. And in here, if you'd like to get the beak, we need to clear the enemies in this room to open the door on the left side. Over here, we need to clear the enemies again. A good way to deal with these iron masks is to hit them with these pots, and if you wait until the right time, you can strand that spark enemy in the lower right corner where it will be difficult for it to hit you. Once you've cleared out all the sparks, you can also pick up some bombs if you need more of those, and then we'll be able to return to the right side where we'll open the chest and find the stone beak. Of course, items like the stone beak and the compass are totally optional, so if you're not interested in getting the beak, the way that we actually need to go is up through this room, where you'll need to clear the three Stolfos enemies to open the door. This owl statue says that if we're having problems destroying a skeleton, we should try using a bomb, and that's a clue for how we can defeat this mini-boss, the Master Stolfos. The normal way to defeat this guy is to hit him with your sword, which will make him collapse into a pile of bones. Once he's disabled, drop a bomb on him, then rinse and repeat. After a few hits, the Master Stolfos will run away, and the doors to the room will open. Over here on the right side, we'll find an empty chest and a message from the Master Stolfos. We'll need to face him three more times to get the weapon that we want. Before you leave, if you need a few more bombs, you can pick up the clay pots in this room, and then head through the passage at the top. Push the block, and then leave and re-enter the room to reset its position. This time you want to head to the top of the screen where you'll be able to hit the switch to open the door on the right, and then another few moves will take you to another battle with the Master Stolfos. If you can get close enough to this guy, he'll talk to you, and he calls you a real pesky kid. There's an easier way to fight this boss than the way we did it the previous time. Simply knock him down once with your sword, and then quickly hit him three times with your arrow bombs. If you can connect with three arrow bombs, you won't have to knock him down a second time. So that's two battles with the Master Stolfos, two more to go. We need to head up this way to find the third mini-boss room, and it's over here on the left. To get through this room, you need to clear three of the gel enemies, and to find the third one, you want to pick up this clay pot, and it'll pop up on the left side. That skull on the ground means it's time to face the Master Stolfos again. We know how to defeat him now. Simply knock him down with your sword, and hit him with three arrow bombs to send him packing. In the room on the left side, we'll find the dungeon map. Keep in mind that if you're playing the original black and white version, the contents of some of the treasure chests may be shifted around, but as long as you open all of the chests, you'll find everything that you're looking for. One of the enemies dropped a piece of power for us, and although we have the level 2 sword and already are killing any basic enemy in a single shot, the enhanced movement speed that we get from the piece of power is still a nice bonus, so it's worth picking up. Now if you recall from earlier, there was another one of those Master Stolfos rooms right near where we found the first key, and that's where we're going to face him the final time. So we want to head all the way back there. So make your way down to the bottom, pretty close to the dungeon entrance, 
and you'll need to clear the enemies in this room to open up the door on the left side once again, and we're going to head into this room where we found the compass. Go down the stairs, use the lifts to get across to the left, you really only need to touch that first lift, you don't have to jump on the last one. And once you get up here, we're going to head over to the left, where we'll face the Master Stolfos for the final time. If you talk to him this time, he makes an Energizer Bunny joke, which was probably pretty funny when this first came out. Knock down the Master Stolfos and don't hold back. Three arrow bombs will finish him off, and this time he'll explode, leaving behind the hook shot. There have been numerous places where we've needed the hook shot, and if you've played other Zelda games, you should have a good idea of what you can do with this thing. Something that may surprise you, however, is how good it is as a weapon. The hook shot is a very powerful weapon, and it doesn't require any ammo like the bow and arrows do. It's especially good against these iron masks. If you hit one from behind, it just dies, and if you hit it from the front, you'll remove the mask, leaving it defenseless. In this room, if you head over to the right, we can use the hook shot to get across and collect this chest that we saw earlier. It contains 200 rupees, and the game says that I'm ecstatic, but... eh, not really. So we're just going to head up this way, clear out the enemies and go through the door, and then we're going to continue to the right. We need to find the Nightmare's Key, and it's hidden in a very devious location. Carefully make your way to the left and up through this room. You can use your Pegasus boots to clear out those objects if you want to, but it's certainly not mandatory. Head up into this room, and dive down in the dark water to reveal a hidden passage. Swim through to the left, and if you need to restore your health, you can go up and jump on that Goomba. Remember, if you jump on a Goomba, it will always yield a heart. So if you need to get some health, you can get some up here, and then head up the ladder in the upper left corner. In this room, we'll see another use for our hookshot. If you grab the edge of a bridge, you can pull it across. In the chest on the left side, you'll find the Nightmare's Key, so just pick it up and then head back the same way that you came. We'll swim back through this passage. If you need any hearts, remember you can kill that Goomba. And then we'll go back to the top of this room, which will take us back from whence we came. Before we unlock the way to the dungeon's boss, we can head over and up through this room to find a few more treasure chests. So you can see one right there, but we're going to take the long way around, and you can hookshot across to this chest which contains rupees, but something interesting that you'll see here is you can use your hookshot to extend a bridge from this side. So you may not have known that was possible, but it is. And down here we'll find 50 rupees, and over in this room we'll find a small key. Once you have the key, you can hook shot back across to the left, and we want to go back to the room that contained the empty treasure chest, to the right of where we fought the first Master Stolfos. So we're going to head down and through the room where we need to push the block in the middle. So push the block, and then we'll reset that block and push it again. And when we go down, this is the room that we were looking for, and we haven't been through this passage yet. Make sure to stay at the top as you jump across here, and go through to the left. There's another mini-boss fight in this dungeon where you have to fight a pair of Gomas. But by going this way, you can actually skip that battle altogether. Up here you'll find an owl statue that gives you a clue about finding the Nightmare's Key. Uh, thanks, but we have it already. And as we head through here, you can see the door to the boss's lair. You simply have to push this block, jump over the stairway, and go through the key to be able to get up there. 
we can go to the boss right now. Going directly to the boss is recommended, but just for fun, let's trek back to the other side of the dungeon and take on those gomas. So we're going to cut through here and take the stairs in the upper left corner. As you go through this passage, you can jump on these enemies to kill them. They're Mario-inspired enemies, so you can use Mario-inspired tactics to defeat them. Looking at the map, you can see a small cluster of rooms that we haven't visited yet, so that's where we are going to next. And we'll head through this room, switch on our Rock's Feather, and make our way down. We'll just avoid the enemies here and quickly head over to the left. Oh, we missed a piece of power, but that's okay. And we will need to clear out the iron masks in this room to open up the door, so we can use our hookshot to easily defeat them. Up in here, we've definitely not been to this room yet, and if we need to get some arrows, we can jump and collect them right now. Use your hookshot to quickly get across to the left. If you just try to jump across to the left, you'll likely get hit by those enemies. And in this room, we'll find a small key that you'll only need if you're going this way. So you can actually just skip that key normally, but we'll get it and head back to the right. We'll need to extend the bridge on the right side to get up to the next room, and if you need to refill your health, this clay pot contains a fairy. So you can pick that up. And in this room, whenever we go to the left, that's where the gomas are. So once you head through that key block, be ready for a fight. Traditionally, you would need to use a bow and arrows to defeat a goma, but in this game you have the option to use the hookshot. If the boss is shaking when it stops, that means it's going to charge at you and you need to get out of the way. If it stops totally still, it's about to open its eye, and that's when you can hit it for damage. It takes more hits to kill one of these things with a hookshot than with the bow and arrow, so unless you're trying to conserve ammo, you should use your bow and arrows against these guys. We have plenty of ammo available, so we'll use the bow for the second Goma. It's not moving at all right now, so that means the eye is going to open and it's shaking here, so we need to get out of the way. These bosses are usually pretty easy, but there's another strategy you can try. Equip your Ocarina and play the Ballad of the Windfish. Whenever you do this, both Gomas will open their eyes and you'll be able to quickly get hits with your arrows. Once they close the eyes, you can play the Ballad of the Windfish again making them open the eyes once more. Just keep doing this over and over again, and you should have no problem defeating the twin Gomas. Of course, you don't actually have to defeat them at all, but either way, you'll be able to get through and open up the path to the next room. You'll also open up this convenient warp space that can take you back to the dungeon entrance, but you probably won't need that either. If you did get killed by the dungeon's boss, this would be a fast way to get back there. And down in this passage, you can use your hookshot to connect to the gargoyle up above, and then we can stomp these Goombas for a few extra hearts. We need to head across to the left, and go up to the top of this room, where we'll climb the ladder, and then we'll be mere inches away from the boss's room. So just hook shot across to the left and our nightmare's key will open the way to the slime eel. As you enter this room, the ground shakes and through the floor bursts the tail of the slime eel. Stay on the far left or the far right of the room and let it go by you two times before you even think about moving into the center. We need to use our hookshot to pull the slime meal out of the wall whenever an opportunity presents itself, and you can line up with the inside of that green tile to make sure that you get a good shot. You want to be farther away from the boss when you pull it out of the wall with the hookshot, 
so that you can move towards it and get multiple hits with your sword as it retracts into the wall. If you're good, it's possible to defeat this boss in two cycles, but it typically takes about three. So wait for the tail to pass you, get into position, pull out the slime meal, and strike its heart with your sword. Once it's defeated, it has a cryptic message for us. It seems that we don't know what kind of island this is. So we'll have to ponder that as we collect our heart container and head up into the treasure room where we'll find the Wind Maramba. Now that's the normal way to finish this dungeon, but just like the previous level, the Angler's Tunnel, with just a few simple tricks, there's a much easier way. So let's take a look at the fast way through the Catfish's Maw. Just like the previous time we went through this dungeon, we want to head all the way to the left so that we can go through the hidden passage to collect the first key. We're in a bit of a hurry this time, so we're going to skip right past the compass, and we're just going to quickly jump through this passageway, lowering the platform on the right side so that we can quickly get through to the left. In this room, we'll take out the enemies and then push the blocks into the center to get that first silver key. So far, we haven't done anything differently, but once we have this key, we'll be able to make some changes to our strategy. So push the blocks together, and once you have the key, don't bother going in the room on the left. Just head back down the stairs and make your way to the right. Once we get through here, we're going to need to clear out the iron mask enemies so that the door will open, and then we'll head through to the right. So we'll take these guys out, open up the door on the right side, and we're going to use our key in the keyhole up above. We're just going to head straight up here to the first Master Stalfos battle. So take out these enemies as quickly as you can, and here is our first trick. We're going to knock down the Master Stalfos, and then we want to hit him with two arrow bombs, and we'll let him get up. So one, two, then we're going to knock him down again and hit him with two more arrow bombs. Because we hit him with a total of four arrow bombs, he actually explodes and he'll leave us a small key. You'll also notice that the boss music continues to play, which is a weird side effect of doing this trick. The way we did it the first time there was the conservative way of performing this trick. If you miss with the fourth arrow bomb and he gets up, then he'll run away and you won't get the key. It is possible to do it with only knocking him down once. You just have to make sure that you hit him with all four arrow bombs. So knock him down and then quickly hit him with four arrow bombs, watching to see if he moves after you hit him with the first few. If you manage to get him with four arrow bombs, he'll drop another key for us, giving us more keys than we need to complete this dungeon. So as long as you can get at least one small key from the Master Stalfos, you won't have to go over to the right to pick up the one in the chest. Of course, if you want to go for extra credit, we can get yet another small key from defeating the Master Stalfos the same way the third time. Of course, the fourth time that you fight him, you're going to get the hook shot, so you don't have to use this trick that time, and you can just hit him the three. We almost messed it up that time, but we did get the last hit in there, so we will get the third key, and we don't need the map, so we can just save and quit to go back to the dungeon's entrance. From here, the last Master Stalfos fight is just a hop, skip, and a jump away. So we're going to travel across to the left, take out these enemies, hopefully this Iron Mask will cooperate with us, and then we'll take out this last bat to open up the door, and we'll just skip on through this room, which will take us to the passage that leads over to where the final Master Stalfos is awaiting us. 
hop over these platforms, avoid the enemies, and head to the room on the left side. Here we'll be able to quickly defeat the Master Stalfos for the fourth and final time with our arrow bomb technique. So we'll just let him have it, one, two, three, give him an extra one just for fun. And this time we're going to get the hook shot, but there are a few more tricks that we can use in this dungeon. We're not quite done just yet. The fastest way to get where we need to go is to save and quit, which will take us to the dungeon's entrance. If you don't like using save and quit, you can also play Manbo's Mambo on your ocarina. That will have the same effect, but it does take longer. Now we need that Nightmare's Key. Use your hookshot to take out the Stalfos in this room quickly, and head up through the door and over to the right. From here, we're just going to go up, push the block in the middle, and make our way to the left. This part is essentially the same as what we did before, so make sure to get through this room, dive in the dark part of the water, and we'll find the secret passage that leads us to where the Nightmare's Key is hidden. I suppose this passage isn't that secret anymore since we've been through it a couple times now, but in any case, make your way up the ladder, pull the bridge across with your hookshot, and pick up the Nightmare's Key. Once you have the Nightmare's Key, you guessed it, we're going to save and quit to go back to the beginning of the dungeon. So do that again, and this time we want to head to the room to the right of where the Gomas are, and we're going to do a trick there to skip the Gomas. Of course, you can skip them without doing any tricks, but this is the more interesting way. So open up the path, pull the bridge across, and up here this is the room we were looking for. Clear out the enemies on this side of the room, and then clip into the right side of this purple block. Using your hookshot, keep tapping it, and you should be able to pass right through the wall. You'll need to pick up the clay pot on the other side to complete the move, but then you'll be able to enter this stairway, and this will take you directly to where the boss is. We can grab a few last minute hearts from these Goombas, hookshot up to the gargoyle, and make our way to the boss's room. We'll need to use one of our small keys to get through here, but we have plenty of those. And once we get to the other side, it'll be time to face the Slime Eel. Let's see if we can defeat the boss in two cycles this time, and I also skipped its text box, which was unintentional, but that's another way that you can save time. So we'll wait for the tail to pass us twice, then move in. Hopefully we'll be able to grab the eel, Try to grab it from far enough away so that you can pull it way out, and you want to move towards the hearth as you attack. Don't attack too rapidly, you want to give it a second between each strike so that it will lose its invincibility frames. You are trying to hit it four times before it goes back into the wall. If you can hit it four times twice, you'll be able to defeat it in two cycles and then we can collect our heart container and head up into the treasure room where we'll be able to get the Wind Maremba. Whether you finish this dungeon the easy way or the hard way, that's five instruments down, three to go. Once more, we'll listen to the Wind Maremba play its beautiful music, and as the dungeon fades away, we'll hear that familiar voice. Shrine, an island secret in the shrine. As you stand on the tongue of the catfish's maw, you can use your ocarina to play Manbo's Mambo and warp back to Manbo's pond. So that's what we're going to do. Now that we have the hook shot, we can finally complete the item trading quest. Doing so is technically optional, but if we can make all of the trades, our reward will be an awesome new weapon, so it's certainly worth your time. Something else that you can do with the hookshot is clear out those white swamp lilies that block the way to the bottle grotto. 
Before the hook shot, we needed to have Bow Wow to get those out of the way. So if you really wanted to go back into level 2 for some reason, now you can. We have no need to go back into level 2, so we're going to head down here to the left, where we can take a quick detour and explore the optional caverns on the edge of the map. If we go up these stairs, you'll see that this area connects to the western Taltal Mountains, and this owl says music. The fish stirs in the egg. You are there. Yeah, I suppose that we are. Inside the right cave, you can pick up this object using your power bracelet, and inside the chest, 50 rupees. We already have the maximum amount of rupees, but if you needed some more money, you'll be able to find it in here. On this side, you can use your hook shot, or you can simply just use your feather to jump across. You don't have to do anything fancy. And inside that chest, you'll find even more money. Once you've collected the money from the caves, we can go down here to Mr. Wright's house. And this is one of my favorite scenes in the game. The letter came with a photograph. Yeah, that's Christine, all right. It just goes to show you that even at the dawn of the internet, people were already catfishing each other. Mr. Wright gives us a broom and... Look, I don't claim to know everything about women, but I don't think a broom is a very good first gift. That's probably why he's still single. A new broom may not be the best gift for Christine, but there is a character in this game that has an unnatural affection for brooms. That's right, it's Grandma Orira. So we're going to head back to Mabe Village, and we should be able to trade the broom to her for the next item in the sequence. So we'll make a right by the well, and we'll head down past Bow Wow, and... Grandma Orira isn't here. Usually, she would be outside sweeping, but at this point in the game, she's moved over to the animal village, so that's where we need to go to find her. If you need to pick up any supplies, feel free to stop at the store, but we're going to pick up this rock and then hop into the warp hole to get back to the animal village, which is our next destination. If you get sent up to the warp hole in the Tal Tal Heights, you simply need to jump back in to go to the animal village. So that's what we'll do. From here, we'll head to the right, and no ghosts are haunting us this time, so we'll continue up into the upper right corner of the village, and that's where we'll find Grandma. It seems that she didn't bring her broom with her, so she is very happy to receive this gift. In return, we're going to get the fishing hook. Now that we have the fishing hook, you may be thinking that we should take it back to Mabe Village, over to the fisherman near the fishing minigame where we were able to get a piece of heart. But he's not the fisherman that needs a new hook. There's actually a second fisherman in the game, and he's over in Martha's Bay. Before we head over there, if you play the Ballad of the Windfish over near where the walrus was, he'll pop out of the water thinking that you might be Marin. Yeah, we're not Marin walrus friend, we're somebody else. And if we head up here, there's a place in the wall that you can open up with your bombs, and now that we have the hook shot, we'll be able to find a piece of heart inside. Remember that your bombs won't hurt you, so you can stand right next to them as they explode. Push the rock out of the way and equip your rock's feather to jump over the gap. Head around and go up into the next room. Here, we're going to fire an arrow bomb at the rock with the cracks in it to get it out of the way. Then we'll use our hook shot to get across to the left side. And that's where we'll find another piece of heart. We'll need three more before we can get the final heart container. We seem to have reached a dead end over here, but we can simply place a bomb on the wall to open up a path that will loop us back to the entrance. From here, we just need to knock this enemy out of the way, 
jump across, push the rock, and we are out of here. The fisherman that's looking for the hook we just found is not very far from here, so that's where we're going to go next. Head back down and around, and cut back up through the animal village. We're going to follow the path along, past where Marin is singing, and we'll head over to the left. From here, we're going to go down. Watch out for the enemies that hide under the rocks and bushes, as well as the buzz blobs in this area. You can use your hook shot to stun a buzz blob, and then you can hit it with your sword. Pretty nice. This wooden bridge is what we were looking for. Jump off the edge and dive underneath it to find a hidden fisherman. Whenever you talk to him, he will be very excited to see that we have the fishing hook. And we can trade it to him to get his next catch. So certainly do that, and we can watch a pro at work. It looks like he found something big, and it's the mermaid's necklace. Not bad. However, if you were playing the original Japanese version, you would find something else. Instead of finding a necklace, the mermaid was actually missing her bikini top. And that's why you only see her head poking out of the water. She would also call you a pervert if you dive in her area. Once you have the mermaid's necklace, or her bikini top depending on which version you're playing, we know exactly what to do with that. The mermaid is located directly above the catfish's maw dungeon, and whenever you give her the necklace, she'll give you one of her scales. After you take the scale, the mermaid will happily swim away. It was nice doing business with you. With the mermaid scale in our possession, we'll finally be able to unlock the path to the final item in the item trading quest. You may have noticed the mermaid statue in Martha's Bay before, and that's where we need to go. Using the scale, we'll be able to finally complete the statue, and that will open a hidden room. To get across here, we'll use our hook shot, and over on the other side is where the statue is located. So head up and to the left, and simply snap the scale into place. Finally completed, the masterpiece slides to the left, revealing a stairway below. And inside, it's the magnifying lens! Also known as the magnifying glass, once you have this item, you don't need to equip it, you'll just suddenly start seeing things that you weren't able to see before. Using the magnifying glass, we'll be able to find a number of hidden things, and the first is located right here under the bridge. Now that we have the magnifying glass, you'll notice that the photographer is swimming below the fisherman. And whenever we talk to the fisherman, he's going to catch him and reel him in. This will allow us to get another photograph for our album. It does make you wonder though, was the photographer here before and we just couldn't see him because we didn't have the magnifying glass? Or is he here now just by coincidence? There are some questions we'll just never get the answers to. From here we're going to swim back to the animal village because there's another hidden photograph that we'll be able to find now that we have the magnifying glass. So get out of the water up here, and then walk down and over to the right. You may recall earlier in the game that there was an empty house in the upper right corner. That's where we're going to go, and now that we have the magnifying glass, we can find a hidden Zora up here in the corner. This Zora has a clue for us, but first, we'll take a picture with a photographer who is looking strangely white today. I'm not sure what that's all about, but we got the picture, I found Zora, and if we talk to him again, he'll ask us to keep a secret, but wants us to go to the Toronto shores where we can find someone else by using the magnifying glass. So that's what we need to do next. 
Over on the Toronbo shore, we'll find the real payoff for getting the magnifying glass. We didn't just get it so that we can take a couple pictures. We're going to get an amazing weapon over there, but we're going to have to trade something for it. To get it, we're going to trade our shovel. You're also allowed to trade the Pegasus boots, but we can still use them. We found everything we need to find with the shovel, so it's okay to turn it over. The fastest way to get to the Toronbo shores from here is to head past the ghost's house. So we're going to jump over this pit using our Pegasus boots and our feather. And then we're going to continue up this way where we can pick up a rock and we'll be able to make our way onto the shores. Way back at the beginning of the game, we walked by this cracked wall, but we didn't have any bombs to open it with. Well, we have them now, but even if we had them back then, this cave appears to be empty until you have the magnifying glass. Now that we have it, we can see that there's a Goria in the cave, and he has an amazing deal for us. We can exchange our shovel for the boomerang. You'll want to make sure that you equip your shovel on button B before you talk to this guy, because he won't accept just anything for the boomerang. If you really want your shovel back, this guy does take returns, but the boomerang is such an amazing weapon, you'll forget all about your rusty old shovel. In other Zelda games, the boomerang would just stun most enemies so that they can be more easily defeated with your sword. In Link's Awakening, the boomerang is a vicious weapon that destroys whatever it comes in contact with. This thing doesn't stun at all. These phasers are set to kill. But that's not all. You can also use the boomerang to cut through bushes, flip switches, and pick up items. It is extremely useful. And now that we have the magnifying glass, we can finally read that book in the library with the tiny print. It will contain some directions that we'll need to use in the final part of the game, so if you choose to read the book, make sure to write them down. If you never look at that book, there is a set pattern that you'll be able to follow, so you may want to avoid reading it altogether. This book on top of the shelves can be knocked off using your Pegasus boots, and it contains instructions on how to enter the color dungeon, but we already know how to enter the color dungeon. We did that back in part one. Once you're done in the library, head on out and make your way up and to the right. We're going to go across the village. We want to exit out the right side, pick up the rocks, and go through the warp hole to the tall, tall heights. There's a large part of the map on the right side that we haven't explored yet, and that's because we didn't have the hook shot before. So once you go through this warp hole, we're going to start making our way to the right, and you'll see exactly where we need that hook shot. It's right over here. So we equip it, and you're going to attach yourself to that donut-shaped stone on the right side, and that will take you across. Heading down is a dead end, but if you head over to the right first, you'll find a small house that says Raft on the top. That's right. It's time for the River Raft Ride. Pay this man a hundred rupees to rent a raft, and you'll be able to cruise down the river. If we take a look at this sign, it says, Do you want to challenge the river rapids on a raft? Well, yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. So jump onto the raft and start riding it over to the left. You could drop down this first waterfall, but you'll probably want to go all the way to the end. If you head all the way to the left and drop down here, you'll be able to collect a few items and you should be able to steer your raft over to this island where you can find a chest containing 20 rupees. Not bad, I guess. And then if you head over here, you'll be able to find another chest containing 20 more rupees and an owl that says nothing particularly useful. 
make sure you have your feather equipped so that you can jump and collect the items that are in the air. You'll need to collect a lot of rupees to be able to make your 100 rupees back, and it's very easy to get caught by the current in such a way that you'll miss the rupees that are in the air. We're going to need to go on the river cruise twice to be able to see the entire thing and open up the entire map, so this first time was maybe not our best. We can certainly do better, and it looks like we're probably going to lose money on this first run. So we had 999 rupees when we started, and now it looks like, yep, we only have 969. So we lost 40 rupees in the deal, but I'm sure that we can do better, and if you head up through this cave, it will take you right back to the top of the rapids. I'd like to make it very clear that taking a river rapids ride is completely optional and there is nothing important to find out on the river. Nothing at all. Just money and some ammo for your weapons. As far as a money making trick goes, it's not a very good one and if you're not very good at the river rapids, you could definitely lose money. So keep that all in mind, if you just want more rupees, your best bet is to go to the color dungeon and do that trick, and it may be better to just play the trendy game. But if you'd like to just have some fun and see how many rupees you can collect, the River Rapids is a good time. But that's really all it is. If you'd like to try to make a lot of money, I recommend staying over here on the right side. You should be able to collect a lot of rupees over here, and then you can follow this path over to the left, but stay down at the bottom where you'll be able to collect even more loot. So just skip through this screen and you'll be able to get all of this stuff right here, and then head down to this level where you'll find even more rupees up in the air, and we found enough to actually make up for the money we lost the first time. So we did way better in that second run, and that's how I would recommend going through the river raft ride. Conveniently, the rafting ride will let you out near the Fae Shrine, which is where we needed to go next. If you need a ferry, you can blow this wall open with some bombs, but you won't find anything if you have full health. So you'll see a ferry here if you've taken any damage, but right now we're doing just fine. And if we head down to this screen, we get a new message from Hedwig. Our owl friend tells us that there are two shrines here, and we need to go to the south one first. That's where we're going to find the face key, and that's the key that we'll need to get into the next dungeon. So we haven't done the key thing in a while, but we will need to do it for the next two. Use your power bracelet to pick up the rocks in this area and make your way through this rocky maze. Head down here, and if you go up this way, there's an owl statue that tells us, the windfish slumbers long, the hero's life is gone. Very ominous, but if you use your pegasus boots on the lonely tree back there, you'll find a fairy. Nice. Down here we'll find an area filled with pillars and Armo statues. The typical way to deal with the Armo statues is to bump into them which will make them come to life, and then you can shoot them with an arrow. But there's actually an easier way. You can just use your shield. Whenever you bump an Armo statue with your shield, you'll move it out of the way but you won't wake it up. That way it won't try to attack you, and you can easily get around here. Underneath one of the Armo statues on this screen is a hidden stairway, and inside is a chest that contains rupees because we already have the level 2 sword. If you did not have the level 2 sword, that's another place where you can find a secret seashell, so if you were short on your secret seashells before, that's a good place to get one. Once you have the shell or the rupees, make your way back to the left, bumping the Armo statues out of the way with your shield, 
Although this one at the top we may need to animate and hit with an arrow, but we're going to need to use some arrows in the next area anyways, so head on inside. Make sure your bow is equipped because it's time to fight the giant Armos. Stay at the bottom of the screen, face upward, and keep firing your arrows into the left side of the boss. You'll need to hit it multiple times, so just keep shooting the arrows and it should have no chance of getting close to you. As long as you don't run out of ammo, you should have no problem defeating this guy. So if you're short on arrows when you get here, make sure to find some in the clay pots in the first room. Behind the boss is a darkened room and a disturbing revelation. You'll need to light the lamps to read the message carved on the back wall, but once you do, it will all become clear. To the Finder The Isle of Koholint is but an illusion. Human monster see sky, a scene on the lid of a sleeper's eye. Awake the dreamer and Koholint will vanish much like a bubble on a needle. Cast away, you should know the truth. What? Illusion? Take a moment to let that all sink in, and before you exit, make sure to pick up a few arrows from the clay pots near the entrance to replenish your supply. We might need some more of them later. As we exit the shrine, we meet our owl friend again. But if you were hoping he had answers for us, he doesn't. He just has more questions. Was what we read in the back of the southern shrine true? Is everything on this island just an illusion? And if we wake the windfish, it will all just go away? Well, I guess there's only one way we can find out. But before we move on, you can go in and out of the Southern Shrine as many times as you need to to collect more arrows. So take this opportunity to refill, and then make your way outside. Now that we have the face key, we can make our way to the Northern Shrine, which is dungeon number 6. To get there, we'll head back the same way that we came, pushing these Armos Knights out of the way and taking out any other enemies that get in our path. We want to go to that small island where we met the Owl earlier. On that island are two Armos statues, and if we push one of them, we'll find a hidden passage underneath, and that's how we'll get to the Northern Shrine. So head up this way and make your way to the left. You're going to need to pick up some rocks here, and also cut through some bushes, so equip either the boomerang or your sword, as well as the power bracelet, and head up to the top and back over to the left. The last time we came through here we had full health, but this time we've taken some damage, so there will actually be a fairy in the fairy fountain. We'll close our eyes and relax, and suddenly we'll have full energy again. From here, we're just going to head downwards, and this is the island that we were looking for. We want to push the Armo statue on the left side, and you can also use your boomerang to defeat the Armo statues, although it takes two hits with the boomerang, and only one with the arrows. Down here through the passage, you're going to use your hook shot to get to the other side. So just shoot on across, and take the stairs up, which will lead you to the northern shrine. You want to go up the right side where you'll find the keyhole, and once you insert the face key, the shrine will rise out of the ground. Now we can finally go on inside. Level 6 The Face Shrine features some new enemy types and some devious puzzle designs. Run past the enemies in the first room on the left, and in this room you'll discover that your boomerang can kill the spark enemies, and they'll always drop a fairy for you. In this room we're going to place a bomb near the crystal switch, and then wait up here behind this post. That way we'll be able to go up into this room and use a bomb on the right wall where we'll find a hidden opening. You won't need to light the lamps in here, just take out the three gel enemies and a stairway will appear in the upper right corner. 
Make sure to equip your feather in here. Watch out for the large spark enemy and climb up the stairs on the left. You can simply jump over this one and in this room you want to head directly over to the right and place a bomb. Do this right away and you'll catch the two whiz robes as soon as they appear. Then you'll just need to take out the other enemy and you'll open the door that leads to the power bracelet too. This upgrade to the power bracelet will allow Link to lift enormous objects, including the large elephant statues that you see in this room. So pick those up and head through the one-way door, and that will take you back to this room with the crystal switch. Flip the switch and plant a bomb by it once again, this time you want to wait in the upper left. There's a hidden switch in the upper left corner of this room, so pick up this pot and underneath it you'll find the switch that will open the door. And in this room we're going to need to fight some whiz robes. Use your boomerang to stun them and then drop a bomb on top of them while they're stunned. If you don't have the boomerang you could try dropping a bomb on top of the whiz robe right as it disappears. That's the timing that you need to use but it's much easier to just use your boomerang. Once you've defeated those whiz robes, you'll find a chest that contains the map, and you can see the map of this dungeon is appropriately shaped like a face. If you head up and to the right from this room, you'll find another chest, and this one contains the beak. So that's pretty handy. And if we head over here to the left, we can pick up one of these pots and throw it against the door to open it. Well, assuming that an enemy doesn't get in the way. But that time we were able to do it, and if we head over to the right here, we'll find a chest that contains the compass. So now we have the map, beak, and compass, and they were all fairly close to each other. Not bad. This room also contains a crystal switch that will flip before we leave, and there's some more bombs there if you need them. In this room, we'll throw an elephant statue at the door to open it, and up here we can open a chest that contains 100 rupees. Behind the rupees, we'll find an exit that leads to a small island outside. That chest contains rupees now, but if we did not have the level 2 sword, it would contain a secret seashell instead. You'll need to keep throwing these horse heads until they both land right side up. It's random, so you'll want to position yourself so you can keep throwing them over and over again until it happens. If we follow the upper path in this room, it will lead us to an area where we can find another small key. So just follow the path along to the right and take it up here where we'll need to fight some whiz robes. They're going to appear in the two empty spaces so you'll know where to place your bombs. Try to place a bomb on the one on the left and then use your boomerang to stun the one on the right. Once you have the key, head back the way that you came. There are a few more chests over here on the left side of the map but for the most part, we've cleaned out this side, but we haven't seen anything over on the right, so we're going to make our way over to that side of the map next. First, we'll head down here, and in this room, we'll flip the switch using our boomerang, but then we'll use a bomb for a delayed trigger so that when we enter this room, we can cross over and head up in the upper right corner. Heading up here is totally optional, but we can find one of those owl statues that tells us we need to enter the space where the eyes have walls, and that's a clue that tells us that the eyes on the map are important rooms that we need to visit. In this room, we can pick up that elephant statue using our power bracelet too, and toss it at the door to open it up like a key. We can do the same thing in this room, but before we head out, we can pick up a hundred rupees in this chest. It says that you're happy, but and probably be happier with almost anything else. This room has another chest that contains 50 rupees, and if we head down here to the right, we'll be back to the dungeon's entrance. 
I recommend equipping your rock's feather for the next room. There are some conveyor belts on the ground, and the feather will make it easier to get across them. In this room, you'll want to equip your feather and your boomerang because the floor tiles attack. The easiest way to avoid the floor tiles is to kill them with your boomerang, but if they get too close, simply jump and you should be able to avoid the damage. We have a key for this door, so we'll head up here, and this room appears to be a dead end, but when we pick up these pots, we start finding bombs. Hmm, could that be a clue? Well, if you place a bomb on the top wall in the middle, you'll open a hidden passage, and you'll want to make sure to equip your feather and power bracelet before you go through, because it's time to face a mini-boss, Smasher. The best way to fight Smasher is to grab the ball as soon as you can, and you want to throw it at the boss when he's heading towards you. This will make the ball bounce off of him, and will make it easier for you to grab it again. Once you defeat him, you'll open up a warp that can take you back to the beginning, and if you head up through this room, you'll notice that an infinite loop has been created. You'll just keep going up through the same four rooms until you pick up this elephant statue that has the hidden passage that we need. So you want to head through here to the left and climb up the ladder, and that will take us to another room that has floor tiles that will attack you. This time they open up pits in the floor, which makes it a bit more difficult. Just stay in one of the corners, attack whichever floor tiles you can with your boomerang, and jump to avoid the other ones. Once you survive them all, you'll find a small key, and you'll be able to unlock the key block in the upper right corner. In this room, we're going to pick up that elephant statue and use it to open the door on the left just as we've done many other times in this dungeon. In this room, we'll find those horse heads again. Just keep tossing the horse heads until they land the way that you want them to. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. Just keep tossing until you get the result you're looking for. The door will open on the left and we'll be able to take this passage, where you'll want to equip your Pegasus boots to quickly get underneath these thwomps. You can do the same thing in the room on the right and then climb up the ladder. And in this room, you'll find three Poles voice enemies. If you play the Ballad of the Windfish using your Ocarina, you'll kill them all instantly. That will open up the doors and we're going to head up. This room is easy to get through because we have the boomerang to deal with the spark enemies and we can even get some health back from the fairies that they drop. You can also find some arrows and bombs in here, so this is a great place to restock. Up in this room, we'll find a treasure chest that contains... more rupees. You're ecstatic. Yay. More importantly is the crystal switch in this room that we will need to flip. We do need to keep tossing these horse heads until the door opens up, so we'll do that first. But once you're done, use your boomerang to hit the switch, and then head back down the way you came. Once again, we'll lift up these pots to get them out of the way and use the boomerang to clear out the spark enemies, and then we're going to go down. This is the room that we came in that had the poles voices. And in here, we need to face the Dodongo Snakes. We fought the Dodongo Snakes before, but this time we have to deal with some pits in the middle of the room. That's not necessarily a disadvantage for us though, because sometimes the Dodongo Snakes can get stuck between those two pits in the middle of the room, making them easier to kill with your bombs. In any case, you need to feed each Dodongo Snake three bombs to kill them, and be careful not to fall into the pit or you will take some damage. Once you're done, head down here, and in this room, we're going to find the small key that we need to open the key block that's over on the left side of this room. 
Now, if we could have just had that key before, we wouldn't have to go all the way back through the dungeon to get up there. But unfortunately, that's exactly what we need to do. Before you head down into the next room, make sure that you have your bombs equipped. You want to place a bomb right here as soon as you get into the room, and you'll be able to quickly take out three of the four whiz robes. You can easily finish off the last one by stunning it with your boomerang and then dropping a bomb on top of him. And then if you head down here, you'll be able to jump across to the right where we'll be able to collect another treasure chest. So as long as the crystal posts are the way that you see them here, and you've been flipping the switches appropriately, you'll be able to just do this move to get over to this side. So head up here, and inside of this treasure chest, you'll find some secret medicine. If you already have secret medicine, you won't get a second one, so don't worry about picking up that chest if you already have the medicine applied. Over here in the infinite loop, we're going to lift up the elephant statue on the left, which will take us down into the hidden passage. That hidden passage will take us across to the left, and that's going to bring us back to that same spot where we fought the Dodongo snakes before. And yes, we are going to have to fight them again, so make sure you have a decent stock of bombs. In this room, you don't have to fight the floor tiles again, just head up, lift up the elephant statue and use it to open the door. And in this room, we need to toss the horse heads again. So just do all the same stuff that we did the previous time. That's what we need to do to get through. Once again, use the Pegasus boots to get by the thwomps. So we'll just dash on by those guys and dash on by these ones. Climb up the ladder. And in this room, we're going to play the Ballad of the Windfish to take out these Poles Voice enemies and open up the door at the bottom. We don't need to go up this time, just go down, and once again, fight the Dodongo Snakes. We have plenty of bombs, so we should have no problem defeating these guys. And remember that you can try to get them trapped near those pits in the center of the room. That will make them a little bit easier to fight. Sometimes they'll also get stuck on the side of the room, and that's another way you can take advantage of them. Remember that after you hit them with a bomb, they will always change direction, so don't immediately place another bomb right in front of them. As you head over to the left, make sure not to drop down here, and instead hook shot across to the left. We'll use our key to open that key block, and then head straight up. In this room, you hear that tone that indicates there's a key, but how do we open this chest? Well, if we listen to this owl statue, it says that we need to use the pots around it, so just throw one at the chest, and it'll pop open, revealing the Nightmare's Key. With the Nightmare's Key in our possession, all we need to do now is make our way to the boss, so drop down to the lower level, and follow the watery path to the room with the four whiz robes in it. Whenever you get there, make sure that you have your bombs equipped so that you can quickly place a bomb in the middle of the row of whiz robes, taking three of the four of them out before they have a chance to get you. You can use your boomerang and a bomb to take out the last remaining whiz robe and then head through the door on the left. That's going to take you back to the infinite loop, so just keep working your way up until you get to the room with the two elephant statues and just as we've done several times before, we're going to pick up the one on the left and head down into the hidden passage. You should certainly know what to do down here. Hop across and then leap from ladder to ladder until you get all the way to the left. This time when you're in this tile attacking room, we're going to take the path at the bottom instead of the top. Just work your way around the room and the vacuum mouth will pull all of the gel enemies into the pit, killing them and opening the door. In this room, you'll want to use your boomerang and bombs to take out the one lone whiz robe, and then push this rock out of the way to enter the room above. 
And there's the door that we need the nightmares key for. Strangely, if you light both lamps in this room, the spark enemies will spontaneously die, allowing you to collect their fairies without having the boomerang. The boss here is Facade, and as soon as you enter the room, take a step forward and place a bomb. You can actually hit him with three bombs before the fight even begins. Once things get going, make sure to equip your Rock's Feather so that you can bounce around the room and avoid the tiles that are being thrown at you. When you see the face start to appear, drop a bomb in the middle of the room. It'll only take a total of five hits to defeat this guy, and as he fades from existence, he confirms what we kind of already knew. If we wake the Windfish, everything on this island will be destroyed. As we ponder the consequences of escaping from Koholint Island, we pick up our next heart container and head to the treasure room where we find the Coral Triangle. As we listen to the triangle chime its high-pitched melody, the dungeon fades away, and once again we hear that familiar voice. Mountain. Something calls from the mountain. As we walk away from the face shrine, the owl appears to explain the real stakes of the game. The wind fish is essentially trapped in a coma because nightmares have taken over its dreams. What is the most resilient parasite? An idea. Resilient. Highly contagious. Once the owl leaves, you can play Manbo's Mambo on your ocarina to return to Manbo's pond. We need to press on. The voice that we heard as we left the shrine said that we need to go to the mountains, so that's where we're going to head next. If you need more secret medicine, make sure to purchase some from Crazy Tracy. It's always a good idea to have some of that equipped. And keep your power bracelet on. You're going to need it to move these rocks out of the way. Head over to the right, and we're going to skip the first set of stairs and take the second set that you see, which will take us up into Mount Tamaranch. We've gone this way before, but you'll certainly know you're on the right track when the owl shows up and tells you to head east. Pick up the rock and make your way into the cave. This cave should look familiar by now. You'll need to switch over to your sword to chop through the crystal on the right side. Your boomerang just won't cut it. Push the rocks out of the way and head down the stairs. We're going to go across and up the stairs on the right side. In this room, we're not going to get that heart container piece just yet, but we can use our hook shot to get across to the right side where we can find 50 rupees in a treasure chest. Use your hook shot to get back across, and then use the Pegasus boots to clear these objects out of the way. You'll want to use your boots again on this side, and then exit through the bottom. Out here, we're going to go over to the right, and we've gone this way before when we were heading up to the Angler's Tunnel. Now that we have the flippers, we can swim over to this ladder and ascend higher up into the Eastern Mountains. Cross over to the left, and you'll see a small house. This is the chicken coop. Inside, tending to three cuckoos, it's Luigi from Super Mario Brothers. Luigi lets us know that in the past, cuckoos used to be able to fly, but now they just flap around. And did you know that if you use magic powder on them, they disintegrate? Yeah, that's a little bit messed up, so we're just going to run out of the chicken coop and make our way to the right. If you pick up these rocks and you did not already get the level 2 sword, you would find a secret seashell up here. And on this screen, if you head over to the right, we'll be able to take one more picture with our photographer friend. While backing up to get a better shot, the photographer falls off the bridge, but he snaps the picture in midair. If we want to get deeper into the mountains, 
we're going to have to revive the flying rooster. And to do that, we should play Manbo's Mambo on our ocarina to return to Manbo's pond. To revive the flying rooster, we're going to need to get the third and final ocarina song. And to do that, we want to head down to the signpost maze, which is right near Mabe Village. So keep your feather and power bracelet equipped. That way you can jump over any holes in the ground and pick up any rocks that get in your way. When you get to this screen, we'll head over to the left, but instead of going to the village, we're going to head down past this phone booth. You've seen this area before, but we didn't have all the equipment that we needed previously. You'll also need 300 rupees. This is the signpost maze. You need to hit each signpost in the correct order, so start with this one and follow it downwards. If you read one of the signposts out of order, you'll have to go back to the beginning, so pay attention and follow the directions carefully. We'll read this signpost and head down, and we need to go to the one down at the bottom of the screen. This one will send us over to the left. To get to this signpost, we're going to need to use our hook shot to get across to the other side, and then we'll need to pick up the rock to move it out of the way. So use your power bracelet, and then we'll need to hook shot back across to the right, and follow the directions up to the next screen. Walk around this pit up to the next signpost, and follow it over to the right. Take out any enemies that get in your way, and this is our next sign. It's going to lead us downwards to this signpost, which will direct us to the right, and we can find the next signpost right here. Follow this one up to this screen, and you'll be directed back to the left. It may seem like we're just going in circles, but we're almost to the end. Follow this signpost over to the right, and we want the one on the other side of this rock. It will direct us down, and we need to lift this rock to reach this signpost, and then we'll head over to the left. This is the very last sign. Whenever you read this one, a hidden stairway will appear. Hopefully you have at least 300 rupees, because inside, we'll meet Mamu. Well, he says his name is Mamu, but I would recognize Wart, the final boss of Super Mario Bros. 2 anywhere. Pay him the 300 rupees and listen to the Song of Soul. The performance is... something. This is the kind of music that can raise the dead, and that is exactly what we're going to use it for. We need to play it underneath the weathercock in Mabe Village to revive the flying rooster. But that's not the only thing that we're going to use it for. We'll also need to play the Song of Soul to open up the path to level 8 Turtle Rock. So those are two very important uses, and they absolutely justify the 300 rupee price tag. Once you've learned the song, head back up the stairs, and we're going to head back to Mabe Village. We'll jump across this large pit using our Pegasus boots and the feather. So get a nice dash going, and then jump across. And then we'll head back up past the phone booth. We'll need to pick up a rock to make our way into the village. And you should certainly know where the weathercock is by now. It's over where Marin used to hang out. Once we get over to the weathercock, we're going to need to just push it out of the way. So push it forward and a stairway will be revealed below. Inside we'll find the remains of the flying rooster. Let's try out our new song. So make sure that your ocarina is tuned to number three and play the Song of Soul. After playing it, you'll see this cutscene where the ghost of the dead rooster returns to its body and it suddenly comes back to life. 
Although it's presumably been dead for hundreds of years, the zombie rooster seems no worse for wear, and it wants to be our friend. And we will be very happy to be friends with a flying rooster. If you've played The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, you should have a good idea of what this bird can do. In this game, we'll need to use our power bracelet to pick it up, but you'll be able to hover around while holding the flying rooster until you let it go. You won't be able to leave the screen while you're flying, but you'll be able to fly all over the current screen until you drop the rooster. If you launch the boomerang and pick up the flying rooster before you catch it, the boomerang will continue to attack the enemies and it will also pick up any items. As soon as you drop the rooster, you'll be able to have the boomerang return to you and it will give you any of the items that it picked up. Outside of Canalette Castle, you'll find this stairway protected by a series of five pits. By picking up the flying rooster, you'll be able to float across, and inside you'll find a chest that contains 20 rupees, but if you didn't have the level 2 sword yet, you would find a secret seashell instead. Make your way across to the right and cross the bridge that the monkey built for you earlier. If we head up this way, we can jump into the castle moat, and if we swim around to the left side of the castle, we'll be able to find another piece of heart. This is another very difficult heart container piece to find. There's really nothing that indicates anything is hidden in the water over here. You would just have to be very thorough to explore this part of the castle moat, and you would still have to dive down in the specific spot where the heart container piece is hidden, so that can make it very hard to just randomly stumble upon. But that's where it's located. Make sure to grab that piece of the heart container, and then head back the way that you came. There are only two more pieces of heart left in the game, but the last one is within the level 8 dungeon, so we won't be able to complete the final heart container for some time. Given that your other weapons and items don't work, it's very strange that you can use the power bracelet to pick up the flying rooster when you're in the water. It's not like you would have any reason to pick up other items when you're in the water, so it's odd that that exception was made for the power bracelet. Once you're out of the water, we want to make our way back to Mount Tamaranch so that we can visit Luigi at the chicken coop. We'll pick up this rock and head to the left, and this is the stairway that we were looking for. As we've done many other times, pick up the rock and enter the cave. Here's something exciting to try. Push this rock, cut the crystal on the right, then push the other two rocks to get into the stairway. It's like we've done this before. Make your way over to the right and you'll find another stairway, just as we've done previously, and then you're going to head over to the right. If you want to, instead of using the Pegasus boots in this room, you can use the flying rooster to get around those objects, and you can do it again over here. So it doesn't really save you any time, but it is another way that you can get through there. From here, we're going to head on over to the right, past the waterfalls, past the entrance to the Angler's Tunnel, and then we'll swim over to the stairs and head up into the mountains. Visiting with Luigi is totally optional, but he's the one that told us cuckoos used to be able to fly, and I think he deserves to see the flying rooster before this world ceases to exist. When Luigi sees our chicken friend, he is very impressed, and he gives us a clue on how we can use him. I certainly hope that makes up for torching his bird earlier. So after you're done talking to Luigi, head down here into this cave. In this small cavern, the flying rooster's true purpose will be revealed. We need him to get the bird key, which is the last dungeon key that we'll need to find in the game. 
To get into level 8, we simply need to use our ocarina, and to get through this screen, pick up your flying rooster and fly around to the left. You can use him again to get across here, or simply use your feather. And that's it! We found the bird key! Now we can use our flying rooster again to get back out. Strictly speaking, once you have the bird key, you won't need the flying rooster for anything else. But he's a good bird friend, so we'll be happy to keep him around. If you head over here to the left, this is just a dead end, but it's a little observation deck area that would allow you to see that the bird key is here in case you came to this cave before you had the flying rooster. Once you have the bird key, getting to the next dungeon is surprisingly straightforward. We're just going to head over here to the right and we're going to go back down the stairs and then we'll swim over to the right side of this screen which will take us to another cave. You can simply cut through this cave to the right if you're in a hurry, but if you'd like to collect some treasures, we can place a bomb next to the wall on this conspicuous patch of dirt, which will open up a new area and a quick detour that we can explore. Take the stairs up to the next level, but when you get to this room, don't open any of the chests. If you open even one of them, when you return to this room, they'll all be empty. Instead, head down here first and open up this chest. This would contain a secret seashell if we did not already have the level 2 sword. The real trick to this room is entering from the bottom. You need to push all of the rocks so that they're out of the way of the treasure chests, and each chest contains 20 rupees. Make sure that you collect all of them before leaving the screen, or you won't be able to collect them again. We'll be able to get a total of 100 rupees here, which will give us back some of the money we spent on that Song of Soul. It's not that we really need the money, in fact it's likely that the Frog Song of Soul will be our last purchase in the game, but it's still nice to have it. Once you're done in the treasure room, head back down the stairs and make your way to the right. That will take you to the exit of this cavern, and then we can head over to the right, and we'll find out that we're near the Eagle's Tower. Beware of the bird. This pit over on the right is a quick exit from this area, but we want to climb higher up into the mountains, so we'll take this cave instead. This cave has only one path that you can follow, so just take it around to the right, and when you get outside, you're just going to wrap around to the left, where you'll find the inside track of the same cave. So we'll take that around, and we'll find a stairway, which will take us up here, and we're going to follow the upper path, and when you get down to this part, you could pick up your rooster to float across, or you can use your hook shot, and just shoot your way to the other side. Dealer's choice. Out here, I wonder if there might be something hidden behind this wall. Hmm, oh well, look there is. It's a fairy fountain. Of course, if you haven't taken any damage, there won't be a fairy here, but we did have a half heart of damage on us, so we'll restore that point and head back outside. There's only one other way we can go here, so make your way into this cave and follow it up to the stairs. This area looks like a skull. Ominous. Once you get outside, head over to the left, pick up the rock, and insert the bird key into the keyhole. This will cause the tower to spin around, and it seems that the entrance was just on the other side. I think we could have maybe just walked around it. Well, in any case, head on inside. Level 7, the Eagle's Tower, is by far the most notorious dungeon in the game, and is some of the most clever puzzles. Once you get inside, you want to make your way over to the right. Avoid the traps, and when you get to this room, defeat the two like-likes using your boomerang, and you'll get your first small key. There's a keyhole right here to go through, so press through that door and take the stairs up to this level. Now, using your boomerang, just throw it diagonally at the crystal switch, and you'll be able to grab the mirror shield, 
without any hassle. It's a lot more complicated to get it if you don't have the boomerang, but we do have it, so grab the mirror shield and then jump into this pit. That will take you to this ledge down here on the first floor, and if you walk to the upper right corner, you'll find another small key. Once you have it drop down and... Is that Kirby? Yeah, yeah, that's Kirby, all right, and he is quite dangerous. Watch out for him, use your mirror shield to protect yourself from lasers, and make your way over to the left. The mirror shield isn't that much better than the shield we had before, but it does protect you from lasers, so that is a nice bonus. In this room, it's the horse heads again from level 6. We know what to do with these, just keep tossing them until they both land right side up, and you'll find a treasure chest containing the map. Once you have the map, head down and you're going to push this purple block out of the way and make your way to the left. In this room, jump over those spikes on the floor and continue upwards. In here, oh, it's the three of a kinds again. You want to try to stop them all on the same suit, and remember, if you can stop them all on hearts, you'll get small hearts when they die, and if you stop them all on diamonds, you'll get rupees. No matter what you stop them on, you'll be able to find a compass in the chest. Alright, so far so good, but here's where things get a little bit tricky. Drop into this pit, and we're going to follow along the posts. Make sure not to step off of the posts until you get to this stairway, and then you're going to jump to this set of posts over on the right. Follow them along to the left, jump to collect the heart if you need it, and if you head upwards, the posts will lead you to a dead end. So this is not the way that we need to go. Instead, you want to follow the posts down. Don't let Kirby pull you off of the posts with his vacuum mouth. When you get down here, you'll be able to open this chest to get a stone beak, and then you can drop off of the posts and go up the stairs. Because we have the boomerang, we can kill these spark enemies and get fairies. And down here, it's another Hinox. The best way to defeat a Hinox is to use your arrows, and the lanterns in this room will shoot fireballs at you, so you definitely want to take this guy out fast. Once he's defeated, he'll drop a key, pick it up, and then drop into one of the pits on the left side. That will take you to this ledge, and if you follow it up to the upper left corner, you'll be able to get 20 rupees from a chest. That particular chest would contain the last secret seashell in the game, assuming that you did not already have the level 2 sword. Once you have it, head back up the stairs and through the Hinox room. You will not need to fight him again. Skip past the three of a kinds for now, and in this room, we're going to use our boomerang to flip the crystal switch, and then we're going to go up the stairs. This floor will actually change a bit after we solve some puzzles, but for now we want to head up to this room, where we'll fight a mini-boss, the Grim Creeper. The Grim Creeper is super easy. Equip your sword, go to the upper left corner, face downward, and just start mashing the attack button. The bats will fly into your sword and will all be defeated. You need to clear an entire wave of bats to defeat the Grim Creeper. And whenever he's gone, he says, You dirty rat, you killed my brothers. And then disappears for now. As usual, this opens up a warp that will give you a shortcut back to the dungeon's entrance. And that sound means there's a key in this room. We can use our boomerang to clear out the spark enemies, and then we need to push both blocks towards the center of the room to make the chest appear. Inside, that's not just any key, it's the Nightmare's key, so that's a very good find. Once you have it, we're going to head back the way that we came, down and to the left. The way to the boss's room is technically up on this floor, but for now, it's a dead end. Before we can face the nightmare, we'll need to solve the puzzle of the pillars. 
Use one of our small keys to go through the key block and then head up onto this ledge which will allow you to drop down onto the posts and we can make our way up into this room. This owl statue says the riddle is solved when the pillars fall and that's what we're going to do next. We need to use our power bracelet to pick up this steel ball and we need to throw it at four pillars on this floor. So bring the ball with you, use your boomerang to hit the crystal switch, and head down this way. Be careful when you're carrying the ball. If you drop it in a pit, it'll respawn in the room where you first found it. And over here we'll find our first pillar. Toss the ball at it, and it'll collapse into a pile of rocks. And up here, well there's the second pillar. So that's two down, and only two more to go. The next two are a little bit trickier. Carry the ball down here and throw it over the wall. Even when we drop down to the next floor, the ball will stay where we left it. So we're going to follow the posts along here, and we're going to go back up the same set of stairs that we've been using this entire time. So head down near the chest where the beak was, and up the stairs. Now we're going to go down through the room where the Hinox was, and we need to match the three of a kinds here. Defeating them will make a chest appear. The chest only contains some bombs, so that's not very exciting, but it's a place that we can latch onto with our hook shot. Head over here and grab the ball. Toss it across to the other side, and make sure that you don't drop into any pits, or you'll have to come back up here and kill the three of a kinds again. In this room, there's a tile floor that will attack you. The tiles also reveal pits underneath them, so be careful not to fall into those pits or you'll drop to the floor below. Stay in one of the corners, use the boomerang and the feather, and just keep jumping and throwing your boomerang to avoid the tiles. When the tiles have ceased, the door on the right will open, and in this room you'll see one of the pillars we were looking for, and in the lower left corner, you can use a bomb to open up a new path. This room contains another of the two pillars, so that's the last two right there. And here is where we need to use our hookshot to get across to that chest. So use your hookshot to get across here. Remember, if you leave this floor, the three of a kind enemies in this room will come back. And we can pick up the ball and go up to this screen where we can smash the third of the four pillars. We know where to find the last pillar, so just throw the ball across the wall and then drop into this pit. That will take you back to the dungeon entrance. If you head over to the left and up, you'll see a familiar stairway that will take us back up here. Head down through the Hinox room and we'll be able to retrieve the ball. Grab the ball, avoiding the three of a kinds, and make your way back to the left. Head up through this room, avoiding the pits, and go through the one-way door at the top. In this room, be very careful with the ball. Drop it somewhere safe so you can focus on avoiding the tiles. As usual, you're going to equip your boomerang and your feather, and just stay in one of the corners, throwing the boomerang and jumping whenever a tile gets too close. If you take a little bit of damage, it's not that big of a deal. And once the door opens, make sure to pick up the ball before you go through. Once you get into this room, you simply need to throw the ball at the final pillar to make the top of the tower collapse. You'll see a cutscene to confirm that you did it correctly. I don't think the top of this tower is very structurally sound, but we're going to have to go up there anyways. So make your way down here and drop into the pit. This will take us back to the entrance of the dungeon, and we can use this warp to go back to the room where we fought the Grim Creeper. You'll notice right away that this area has changed, and in this room you'll see the door that requires the Nightmare's Key, which we've had for quite some time now. If you head over to the left here, you'll find a room with a small key block that leads to a dead end, so there's no real reason to go in there, but if you'd like to take a more profitable detour, you can head up through this room and then over to the right. 
You may want to equip your mirror shield to protect you from lasers. And in this room, if you can get the horse heads to line up properly, you'll find the last treasure chest in this dungeon. If you're playing on the DX version, this chest will contain secret medicine. In the older version of the game, you'll just find rupees. Remember that you can only have one secret medicine active at a time, so if you already have one, you may not want to go up here. Once you're done in that room, head up to this ledge and use your hook shot to get across. Once you get to the other side, we're just going to head down and over to the right, where we'll find a stairway that leads to the boss. The boss of the Eagle's Tower is the Eagle itself, and when we get to the top, we see that the Grim Creeper is back, and he has a bird friend that makes our flying rooster look pretty sad. Like many other bosses in this game, the Eagle's weakness is the arrow bombs. So equip both the arrows and the bombs, and you're going to fire them simultaneously upwards or downwards as the eagle passes by you. If the eagle starts throwing feathers at you, you need to switch to your mirror shield to block it so that you don't get blown off the edge. But the arrow bombs are so powerful that you may not have to worry about that at all. As the Grim Creeper explodes, he does make a good point. We are all in this dream, whether we like it or not. And if the dream ceases to exist, what happens to us? We'll have to think about that as we collect our heart container and head back down the stairs. You can drop down to the right, and inside, you'll find the organ of the evening calm. As the organ plays a familiar sounding piece of the Ballad of the Windfish, the dungeon fades to white. And as it has every other time, we hear a voice again. Ocarina. The music of the ocarina leads. As we exit the tower, you'll notice that our flying rooster is gone. Has he returned to the earth? Maybe, but I like to think he's somewhere out there chasing hens and getting his long lost DNA back into the gene pool. When you're ready, Play Manbo's Mambo on your ocarina to return to Manbo's Pond. We don't have a lot of side quests to complete this time, so we're going to make our way to the Western Mountains and the Turtle Rock Dungeon. If you need some medicine, you can stop at Crazy Tracy's. It's very inexpensive, so if you don't have any right now, make sure to pick some up. Then we're just going to head up here. We're not going to go all the way into the swamp. We'll just pick up these rocks and make our way to the right. You are not going to believe what we have to do to get up into the mountains this time. And that is total sarcasm. We're going to pick up this same rock that we've picked up a million times and go through this cave. Just to change things up this time around, we're going to push the rock and then use our sword to cut the crystal then we'll push the two rocks near the stairs and go down them. In here, we're going to head over to the right where we'll find another stairwell and that heart container piece. That heart container piece has been haunting us for some time now and it's about time that we collected it. Use your Pegasus boots to cut through those objects and head on outside. From here, we're going to take the familiar path over to the right, past the waterfalls, past the angler's tunnel, and then we'll swim over to the stairs that will take us up into the mountains. We'll head past the chicken coop, and this time we're going to go to the left, so we haven't really gone that way just yet. You'll need to equip your hook shot to get across this rickety bridge, and when we get to the next screen on the left, we're going to see a cutscene with Marin. She says that some monsters put her up here, but what kind of monsters were they? Wallmasters or something? In any case, use your hookshot to get across, and you'll pick her up on the way. It seems that there's something that Marin is desperate to tell us, but then Terran shows up and crashes the party. What is it, Marin? What is it that you're trying to say? And... And over there to the left? I think that's a dead end. You may not want to go that way. 
Well, our friend the owl shows up and tells us that Marin tried to sing the Ballad of the Windfish in front of the egg. Is she trying to wake the windfish? Why would she do that? Doesn't she know what will happen? We need to press on. Make your way to the left. On this screen, you'll see a lonely bush over here. If we cut it, we'll find a stairway underneath. Down here, we'll find a cave that will take us into the western Tao Tao Mountains. But before we head over there, we can place a bomb on this wall to open a hidden path. We'll pick up this enemy and get it out of the way. And no fairy this time, but we'll head down here, and when we go over to the right, it's that missing piece of heart that we keep seeing when we go through the caves. Well, it's nice to finally have that one, and we only need one more piece to get the final heart container. Down here, we'll need to use our hook shot to get across. So we'll equip that quickly and get over to the left side. And that will take us out on the western side of the egg. Watch out for the rocks that bounce through this area. You can avoid them fairly easily, but if you're worried about taking some hits, you can equip your shield and just hold it up to defend yourself. Up here, it may look like there's something hidden underneath the rock in the upper right corner, but there's not. Now you want me to show you? See? Nothing under there. But, there is something hidden under the rock on this screen. There's also 50 rupees in the chest, but this is the main attraction here. Inside is the final resting place of the Mad Batter. Sprinkle some powder on his altar to wake him up, and this time we are going to get the Magic Powder upgrade. So tell him that you're ready for your punishment, and take it like a man. After a hair-raising bolt of lightning, our powder limit will be increased to 40, and all of our ammo upgrades will be complete. We'll say goodbye to the Mad Batter, and head on outside. As we head over to the left, you'll see a familiar Zelda landmark, Spectacle Rock. Drop down, and use a bomb on the cracked area in this wall. In the next room, there's a flamethrower that you need to get past. There's a sneaky way that you can do it without the mirror shield. If you clip into the right side of this wall and then use your Pegasus boots, you'll take a bit of damage, but you can get past the fire. The way that you're normally supposed to do it is to use the mirror shield, and that will part the flames out of your way and allow you to walk through safely. We have the mirror shield, so we can do it the normal way, but I wanted to show you that it's possible to get to this side of the mountain early. From here, the path is straightforward. We just need to go to the left, down, over to the left again, and then left one more screen. We're going to see a strange rock formation. This is Turtle Rock. I recommend clearing out the two crows, because once we play the Frog Song of Soul, this thing is going to awaken, and it's going to be a boss fight. I may have oversold it a little bit, this boss is not very difficult. Just equip your sword, stay in this general position, and rapidly attack the boss whenever it gets close. So just keep whipping it with your sword, stay about this far away from it, and you should have no problem defeating the turtle's head and opening the way into level 8. Well, this is it. The final dungeon. Level 8. Turtle Rock. As soon as you enter this room, you want to shoot off your boomerang. If you do it fast enough, you'll be able to hit that winged demon before it can run away from you. Then you'll want to make your way over to this room. When you touch this object, you'll be able to control it with the control pad. Clear the lava and make a path over here to the left, and when you push these blocks, you'll find the map. This dungeon is very large, so the map will be a welcome addition to our inventory. You can go down by pushing a block into the lava, 
but the way we need to go is through the cracked wall at the top, and we'll need to use a bomb to get through. Once you're on the other side, head down the stairs, and we'll enter a side-scrolling area. Carefully jump across, avoiding the poodaboos that jump out of the lava, and on this screen you want to wait in the middle, and then go across. Once you get to the right side, climb up the ladder, and in this room, we're going to equip our power bracelet so we can throw the clay pots, and we'll also use our boomerang to take care of the snakes here, which are known as ropes in the Zelda universe. Inside the chest, we'll find the stone beak. Handy. We're going to face a lot of mini-boss rematches in this dungeon, and the first one is against Smasher. So you may recall Smasher is this Cyclops Stingray monster, and to defeat him, you need to pick up the ball using your power bracelet, and ideally you want to throw it at Smasher when he's moving towards you horizontally, and that will cause the ball to bounce off of his face, and then it'll be easier for you to pick it back up. For some reason, Smasher always leaves behind two fairies, so fill up your health and make your way up to this room, where we'll find a clue to another room that's coming up. To get out of here, you need to lift up this clay pot and you'll find a switch underneath. And then we'll go back through Smasher's room, and this is the room that we were looking for. Once you touch this object, you'll be able to take control of it, and you'll want to carefully cover all of the black spaces in the floor. If you mess up, you can leave and re-enter the room to reset it, and if you do it correctly, you'll find a small key. Inside this chest, you'll find an enemy, so you don't need to worry about that one. And if we head down here and clear out these enemies, we'll find a hidden stairway. We don't actually need to go through there, I'm just pointing it out. Instead, we want to head over here to the left, and if we enter this room from the bottom, we'll be able to quickly take out the demon with our boomerang. So that's the best way to deal with that guy, and then the door on the left will open. In this room, take out the snakes, and then go through the door at the top. In here, we'll face another rematch with Hinox. We've faced many Hinox at this point in the game. Either use your boomerang or switch over to your arrows for an even more effective solution. Just like before, if you can cover all of the black space in this room, you'll get a reward, but this time it's only 20 rupees, so it's not that big of a deal. We need to go down here, but if you want to investigate this room, that's one that we'll need to come back to later, after we find the item from this dungeon. This time we'll just clear a path leading downwards, and in this room we'll find a chest containing more rupees. You can use your boomerang to take care of the spark enemies, or just try to avoid them. And we probably won't be needing those rupees, but we'll pick them up anyways. You can also get some hearts in this room if you need a quick recharge. And in this room, it's Rolling Bones! Rolling Bones is pretty easy to defeat using arrows, but even easier with the boomerang. And in this room, you'll want to quickly take out the winged demon, and you'll find another small key. So that's going to be important later, make sure to grab it. And if we head down to this room next, we can find the compass. But be careful that you don't get pulled into the vacuum mouth, that will take you all the way back to the beginning of the dungeon. You can use your rock's feather to help keep you away from it. Once you have the small key and the compass from this wing of the dungeon, warping back to the entrance isn't a bad idea at all. So you can just let the vacuum mouth take you there, or use your ocarina to play Manbo's Mambo. Once again, we'll clear out that winged demon using our boomerang, although we did not need to do it this time. Use this object to clear out the lava and make a path up to this area where we can push through a key block, and then we'll need to use our second small key to go through this door on the right. Don't enter this room too quickly or you'll get hit by those traps. You'll notice there's a stairway here, but we don't need to go there just yet. Instead, take the one-way door at the top of the screen. In this room, we'll get a clue from the owl, 
that tells us to defeat the monsters who hold the key, attack them from a higher place. That's some good advice about how to defeat the Dodongo snakes that we're going to face soon, but if we use some bombs to clear out the cracked stones in this room, we'll notice that the tiles on the floor make an arrow pointing at the wall on the left. And if you place a bomb over there, yes, we can go through to the left, but we need to head up this way first. Use your boomerang to quickly take out the Gibdos in this room, but don't stop moving or you could fall through the floor. Once they're gone, you'll be able to get a small key, and then we can head over here to the left. For now, we just want to jump past the Dodongo snakes. There's no point in fighting them unless you're attacking them from the upper ledge, so we'll do that later. Use the key you just found to go through into this room, and that's the door that leads to the boss, but we're not ready for that just yet. Instead, we're going to head to this room, and we'll go down here, where we can find another small key. How do we get the key, you may ask? Well, this owl statue has a clue. It says that we should shoot a strange statue with a bow, and I think it means this one. So use your bow on that statue, and you'll find a key. And if you head down here, you'll be able to refill the ammo on your arrows, bombs, and you'll even get a few hearts back. Over in this room, we can find another small key, so be careful to avoid the laser, push the rocks out of the way, and you'll be able to get the small key from the chest. To get out of here, we need to reset the blocks in this room, so head down here to the left, and then we'll just go back the way that we came. We know now that there's a key in that darkened room below, so we'll need to make sure we go back there later, but for now we're going to head up here, where we'll find a stairway that leads outside. And out here, we'll find the last piece of heart. And that's going to give us another full heart container. Awesome! Completing a heart container will also refill your health. If we head over here to the right, we'll see the fourth and final warp hole. So if you need to go back to the village for supplies, you can use that warp hole, and then you can get back here easily. And once you're done, you should take this entrance back into the dungeon, and that will take us to the upper ledge near the Dodongo snakes. We need to use our bombs to defeat them, and to do that, drop a bomb in front of you, and then pick it up. You'll want to toss it right onto the Dodongo snake's mouth. If you land it carefully, it'll go right in. Wait a second until the snake turns blue again before you throw another bomb at it. And it's almost like the bombs are magnetized to the Dodongo snakes. As long as you're close, it should go in the mouth. If you miss, you are going to have to wait until the bomb explodes so that you can throw another one. You can only have one bomb on the screen at a time. Ideally, I like to work both snakes down here to the lower right corner. It's pretty easy to hit them down here. Once they're defeated, a chest will appear up here on this ledge, so that's why you had to fight them up here. If you fought them from below, the chest would spawn, but you would have to go outside and the Dodongo snakes would come back before you could get the key. If you use your hookshot in this room, you can find a chest that contains some secret medicine. I've probably said this a million times now, but you can only have one secret medicine on at a time, so if you already had some applied, you may want to skip that chest. Also, if you're very low on health, you may want to intentionally take damage so that you can refill and then pick up a fresh secret medicine. Of course, if you needed more health, you could get some from the Goombas down here, and we're going to need to use our hookshot to get across to the right. That brings us back to this room. You may recall from earlier that once we go through the one-way door, this next room had an arrow pointing to the left wall, and we blew that open with a bomb. Well, now that we have three small keys, we can finally go this way. We'll need to use our first key on the key block over on the left side. You don't need to light the lamps in here, you can just make your way through. Although if you're playing the original black and white version, it will be very dark if you don't light them. 
In this room, you can use a bomb on the left wall to open a path that will lead you to another part of the dungeon. We don't need to go that way right now, but we do want to make sure this path is open so we can come through there later. You will not be able to open it from the other side. In this room, we're going to use our hook shot to get across, and then we'll use our third small key to enter this passageway. That'll leave us with zero keys, but this is the way that we need to go. Wait on the platform in the center here, and then jump from moving platform to moving platform to get across to the right. Up here, we're going to face a new mini boss named Blano. I recommend charging up your sword before you get in the room. You only need to hit him with two fully charged sword attacks to defeat him, but if he hits you with his fully powered uppercut, he'll send you all the way back to the beginning of the dungeon. So that guy is dangerous and you need to take him seriously. There was a chest behind Blano, but it's blocked. To be able to access it, we need to return to the beginning of the dungeon and head back here to the lava room. This time we're going to cross over to the right. We need to access this room and we're going to place a bomb on the right wall. So there's no visible cracks in this wall, but if you look at the map, you'll notice that we haven't been in this room and this is where the crystal switch is. Hit it with your sword, and there's also another way you can go down here. So that will take us back to this room, and we'll simply use this object to cross over to the left. We don't need to fill all the spaces, we already got the key. Now that we flipped the switch, we just need to get back to the dungeon entrance, and we'll take that warp back to Blano's room. So we'll head down here, and there's the warp we were looking for, and this time when we head up to the right, the posts will be down and we'll be able to open the chest, which contains the magic rod. Now you can burn things. Burn it. Burn baby burn. The magic rod is a decent weapon that we can use to attack enemies from far away. It's just unfortunate that we won't have a whole lot of time to use it. The magic rod is the last piece of usable equipment that we're going to find, and that completes our inventory. We'll have to head up through the Hinox room again. Now that we have the magic rod, we need to go to that darkened room. We'll be able to use the magic rod to light the lanterns in there, and we'll be able to find another key. So use this object to clear a path that leads upwards, and we'll go up to this room, and this is where we need to use that magic rod. So equip the rod, it's the one that looks like a lollipop, and once you light both lanterns, the chest will appear, and we'll get that small key that we needed. We're going to need that key to open the way to the nightmare's key, and then we'll be able to get to the boss. So we'll head back down through the Hinox room, and that will take us back here, and we'll go up and over to the right where we'll find the lava room. We've been here many times, but we haven't gone up this stairway just yet. So that's what we're going to do this time. Head on up the stairs, and you'll find some ice cubes blocking your way. We'll need to use the magic rod to clear them out. Make sure not to clear the lower row here, or you won't be able to jump up to the top. Down on the left is where we needed that small key, and once you go through, we're going to face cue ball again, except this time, he's swimming on a tile floor around a pool of lava. You want to just keep him in the upper right corner, try to hit him when he turns around, and because we have the level 2 sword, it does not take very many hits to defeat this guy, and it should be pretty easy to beat him. In this room, you need to use this object to carefully cover all of the black spaces in the ground, and if you do it correctly, you'll be able to get the Nightmare's Key. This one can be a little bit tough to do, but if you mess it up, you just need to exit the room and come back in, and the puzzle will have reset, allowing you to try it as many times as you need to. So if you don't get the key, just come down here and head back up and you'll see the puzzle has reset. But once you have the nightmare key, 
you can make your way back to the right, and we're going to drop down on the right side of this room, and then head up to this ledge. We can use our hook shot to get across to the right side, and that's going to get us the last treasure chest of this dungeon. It only contains 50 rupees, but we're up to the maximum amount of money again, so that feels good. Now we're going to hop over here, and we opened up that passage before with a bomb so that we would have a shortcut back to this room. Use your hook shot to get across, and then we're going to go through this side-scrolling section once more. Head over to the right, watching out for the enemies that pop out of the lava, and climb up the ladder. When you get up here, you'll recognize that this was Blano's room, and we can use this warp to get back to the beginning. Of course, you could have just used Manbo's Mambo to get back to the beginning, but that's another way that you can do it. Now we're going to go over to the room to the right of the lava pit again, and this time we're going to take the stairs in the upper right corner. So we haven't been this way yet either, and this is sort of an ice block puzzle. You want to head up to the top and then clear your way down to this level. You can use your feather to jump over to the left and then clear out the last ice block that blocks your way. In this room you want to clear out the lower level and then this row second from the right. Then you'll have an easy path over to the left side. That passage will lead you right here to the boss's room, and this time the boss is Hothead. Hothead will pop out of the lava, and whenever he lands in the lava, he'll make little splashes that can damage you. You want to take aim with your magic rod and keep firing it rapidly. You should be able to get multiple hits whenever you connect with this guy, and it won't take much to finish him off. Hothead reminds us that we too are in the dream, but we can't stop now. Grab the last heart container and make your way into the treasure room. If you swing your magic rod before picking up the thunder drum, yeah, is that a magic rod in your pocket, Link, or are you just happy to see me? As the thunder drum taps out a beat, the dungeon fades away. That was the final siren's instrument. What does the voice have to say to us this time? Egg. The egg on the mountain calls. If you take a look at your overworld map, it should be pretty obvious where we need to go next. There are only a scant few screens that we haven't visited, and that is our final destination. The egg. But whenever the windfish wakes up, this world is going with it. And I know that this dream has been corrupted by nightmares, but maybe we can just let it exist for a little while longer? Maybe? Something you can do with the magic rod is use it to clear out the white lilies over in the Gopanga Swamp. Of course, we could get rid of those using the hook shot already, but that is another way to dispose of them. As we head over here to the right, we're going to make a quick stop over at the photographer's shack so that we can take one last look at our photo album before we go and face the final boss. Before this world goes up in smoke, let's take a look at some of the memories we created. Yeah, I do want to look at the album. Picture number one, of course, is the one that the photographer took here in the studio. It could be a different picture if you told him that you did not want your picture taken. And of course, our date with Marin, when Taryn showed up at the weathercock, and when she landed on us in the well. Those were good times. And there's that picture we took through the window, and when Bow Wow almost bit Link. Over here, our friend the ghost, and number 12, when the photographer fell off the bridge. Number 10 was near the castle, and number 9 with the invisible Zora in the animal village. Number 8 was with the fisherman under the bridge, and if you stole something, this picture is number 7. Well, thanks for the memories, photo guy. It's about time we saw a mountain about an egg. As we head to our final destination, I'm still left with a lot of questions. Was it just a coincidence that our ship crashed here? Or was that storm something that was manifested by the windfish 
in a desperate attempt to awaken? That's another question that we'll never know the answer to. When you head up to the egg, you just need to play the Ballad of the Windfish and the siren's instruments will take over the rest. So we'll head up the stairs, we'll switch over to our ocarina and put on song number one. It's time to open the egg. The eight siren's instruments appear in a circle around our hero. The Ballad of the Windfish is beautiful when Marin sings it, but when the siren's instruments are played together, it's something breathtaking. This cutscene takes a while to play out, but just sit for a moment and let it all sink in. Once that egg opens up, we're going to go inside and face down the final nightmare. And then there will be no turning back. For this world, it will be the apocalypse. So savor it for now, because it won't last for much longer. With a thunderous crack and a familiar fanfare, the egg opens up. Before going inside, we get one last message of encouragement from our owl friend. The time has come. The windfish awaits. Enter the egg. Hoot hoot. Once we jump off the ledge here, we'll be taken to the maze. The solution to the maze is found in a book in the Mabe Village Library, and we did read that book earlier. The solution was four rights and then four ups, so a very easy solution. However, if you haven't read that book at all, you don't need to remember anything because the solution will always be left, left, up, right, right, up, left, up. So if you don't look at the book at all, the solution will always be the same. This is it, the final boss. And with all the equipment we have, this guy doesn't stand a chance. In this nightmare, I'm Freddy Krueger. This dream ends now. One, two, I'm coming for you. Let's rumble. For the first form of the boss, you'll want to use your magic powder. Let it take a jump at you and then unload your magic powder on it. We have plenty of magic powder, so just keep going until you get enough hits. The second form of the boss is arguably the most difficult one. Equip your sword and your feather and face the boss while rapidly attacking with your sword. He'll create an energy ball and it should go right into your sword swings and be reflected back at him. Once he moves to another spot in the room, get in front of him again and rapidly attack some more to reflect another energy ball. The first two attacks that this boss does will always be energy balls that you can reflect. However, after that it will be a 50-50 chance that he may send a decoy at you. So whenever you attack this time, make sure to jump. If it's the decoy, you'll jump over it, and if it's the energy ball, you'll hit it with your sword and reflect it back at him. So that's all you need to do, and once you hit him four times, you want to get to the center of the room and charge your sword. As soon as the black circle starts to expand, rapidly attack it, and you can lock the boss in this position where you can deal enough damage to make him transition to the next form. It doesn't take that many hits to transition him to the next form, but we wanted to be safe just in case. Then you want to make sure to equip your sword and pegasus boots and get to the upper left corner. Keep charging at Ganon Shadow and he'll be quickly defeated. Now switch to your Feather and Boomerang. The Boomerang will kill the Land Mola in a single hit. And now it's time for the final form, Deathle. Jump over the boss's legs and whenever the eye opens up, you only need to hit it with one solid shot of your Boomerang to finish off Deathle. It's really that easy. After a few final words, the boss explodes in a puff of smoke. All we need to do now is climb the stairs before us. And that's it! We've done it! We've beaten Link's Awakening! All we can do now is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cheesy ending. As we climb the ladder to a platform way up in the stars, 
we see our owl friend once again. He commends us for defeating the nightmares and for proving our wisdom, courage, and power. The owl reveals that he was the guardian of the Windfish's dream world, and with that revelation, we know that he royally messed up. The owl thanks us for essentially doing his job for him, and before we go, we get to actually meet the Windfish himself. Goodbye, Hoot. And there, in all of his glory, is the Windfish. At first he speaks in sounds, but then we get the translation. In my dreams an egg appeared, and was surrounded by an island with people, animals, and entire world. But verily, it be the nature of dreams to end. When I dust awaken, Koholint will be gone. Only the memory of this dreamland will exist in the waking world. Someday thou may recall this island. That memory must be the real dream world. Come, let us awaken together. And with that, the wind fish fades away, and the eight sirens instruments play once more. It's time to wake up. What happens to a dream deferred? After playing this game, I guess we finally have the definitive answer. As we watch Koholint Island fade from existence, the music is somehow cheerful and somber at the same time. Deep down, I think we always knew that it had to end this way, but as we watch the island vanish from view, it still feels bittersweet. As the dream collapses, our hero is lifted up by a plume of water. Is this because he's actually in the ocean right now? Or is he being expelled from the blowhole of a flying whale? As our hero's eyes open and slowly adjust to the light, we can hear the seagull's call and the crash of waves against a nearby shoreline. Clinging to a piece of wreckage, Link finally awakens. Had any of it been real? Or was it just a fantasy? Dreamt up as we floated in the sea. As if to answer that question, the ballad of the windfish can be heard in the distance. Climbing up onto the piece of wood, Link can finally relax. As a shadow crosses in front of the sun, he looks up into the sky. Up there amongst the clouds is a large flying whale. Its calls seem to say thank you as it sails off into the distance. As the music swells, our hero cracks a smile, filled with the satisfaction of another completed adventure. Roll the credits. As the final credits roll on Link's Awakening, I have to say, no matter how many times I play this game, that ending always gets me. This game really ambushes you with its storytelling. Here we have a very innocent looking Zelda game, and previous games in the franchise didn't have that much story to them at all. You're mostly just searching for eight MacGuffins and then trying to rescue a princess. Link's Awakening, on the other hand, creates a vibrant world filled with interesting characters that you just can't help but get attached to. And that's why it's so gut-wrenching when the twist is revealed and you find out that victory in this game means being the terminator for this world and bringing about its end. Ironically, Koholint Island is one place that never really changes and never truly goes away. The secret to reviving the island is as simple as starting a new game. The idea of being an interloper in someone else's dream world is a trope that I've seen played out in numerous other video games, particularly one in the Final Fantasy franchise. But I think this game is the first one that I ever played that featured that particular storyline. The puzzle design in this game is also very good, 
none of the puzzles are too difficult, but they're just challenging enough to make you feel smart for solving them, and that's a difficult balance to achieve. I also really like the short side-scrolling segments that break up the action in this game. A lot of people are very critical of the side-scrolling gameplay in Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, but I think this game illustrates that it can work really well. I also enjoy all the cameos from the various Nintendo characters. It seems like in modern times, outside of Super Smash Bros., you just don't see that kind of thing anymore. As the credits wrap up, it's almost time for the special ending. If you can complete the game without dying a single time, it's okay to save and quit the game, just never die and choose continue and save, you'll see a special ending here. Normally, you'll just see the THE end at this point, but if you wait for a moment, you'll see this. I like to think that this special ending means that Marin did get her wish with the windfish, and that she's somewhere out there as a seagull, exploring the world. As the screen fades out, we get one last thank you message from the development team. That's nice. Well, I hope this video was able to help you finally beat Link's Awakening and free Koholint Island from its nightmarish corruption. If it did, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe for more videos, because there will always be more dreams to awaken from. And that's why we'll be back again next week with another video game you can beat. Thanks for watching.